God bless everyone. Thank you for having us. Uh, we've been here a number of times, but uh, we're friends of uh, Pastor Glenn and Carol, so we're not strangers. Anyway, it's always a privilege to share the Word of God because, um, well, I've spent a lifetime with this book, and I think the greatest privilege is to, uh, when God opens a door, you know, and we can just immerse into His words because, um, I mean, it's a message from heaven. The people that wrote this book have all had to die and give their blood to pass this message on to us, yet we take it so easy, you know, we sometimes just keep it on the shelf somewhere and have a look at it sometimes, yet we don't realise that the, um, the precious message, messages that are in there, and as the Lord said to when he rebuked Satan, remember he said to him, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the living mouth of God. So it's a privilege to be able to um, serve him and to uh, even take his words upon my mouth. I feel sometimes so um, worthless. Who am I to be spreading his message? But in his wisdom, he's given uh, me the privilege to serve him all my life. And uh, that's why when Pastor Glenn always asks me, oh, my biggest struggle is what do I preach on? He says, whatever the Lord puts on your heart. And I've got a, from A to Z, I showed him my list. I can preach on any subject that they, people would want. But um, anyway, I've been praying and praying about this. And um, the Lord put on my heart to preach about 2 Timothy 3, which is um, to know these last days that we live in because it's perilous times, as it says. So I'll just read the first verse. Uh, for, this is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, I'm reading, by the way, from the NKJV. I've progressed from the KJV. That was, used, that was my earlier days. The guy shot me down and said, I've got to get more modern, so I'm with the NKJV version now. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come stressful times would come. Let's pray about these verses. I pray that it impact your hearts in every possible way. I'm sure that you're not, uh, uh, you're conversant with the scriptures, but uh, the Spirit leads us to understand how God has not left us in the dark, you know. Uh, these words were placed in scripture 2,000 years ago. And it's like Paul was transported into this time to see the days that we are living in. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that these words would have an impact on our heart. I pray, Lord, that uh, the seed that is sown would be uh, found in the right place because you said that the good seed will always bring the 30 to 60 and 100 fold, Lord. And that's what I pray for because as we read here, it's perilous times that we live in and we need every bit of strength, every bit of wisdom that you can give us to survive in times like this because the days are evil. But we thank you that we are not alone because you said... You will never leave us or forsake us. And I just pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Just to put you in the picture, you probably know, but 2 Timothy is the last letter that Paul wrote. Um, the previous letters that he wrote, he had plenty of time to do. He went to Rome. We see the conclusion of Acts chapter 28 because he was arrested and he was under house arrest, but he was there for two years. And the good physician Luke had left him there. So we find the conclusion of Acts there, chapter 28. Now, from the two years or whatever, 18 months, two years house arrest, he was let go for some unknown reason. There's not much record left of what he was doing, but people say that he went as far as uh, Spain to preach the gospel. But... Second Timothy is his second arrest, and by this time he's knowing the situation. We're in chapter 3, but in chapter 4 he lays it out uh, to Timothy that his time has come. He knows his departure is at hand because, you know, Nero, he was going crazy, and all the Christians were sacrificed to him. So just to put you in the picture, this is where the time that he's in. It's his last letter to the churches, and... He's writing to Timothy. Now also to put Timothy in a picture for you, uh, Timothy was left at Ephesus and uh, he was 
left there for a reason to pass to the church over there. Uh, Timothy uh, had a problem in the fact that he was very young and he was dealing with mature people. And that's why Paul encourages him so much in his first letter. Let no man despise your youth, you know, be an example, stand firm in the Lord. And um, Timothy had to overcome his um, fragility, if I can put it like that, to be able to make a stand in the congregation because Paul left him there in Ephesus. Um, to be a pastor, to lead the church, because there's a church being formed. Again, through Corinthians, I'm just putting you in the context of history here. Again, through, um, sorry, in, in, in Acts, you will see that when he's left at Ephesus, he was there for 18 months to two years, and there was no record of what he did there because the good physician Luke had left him again for a couple of years. Um, and Paul later on, you know, in Second in Timothy, in First Timothy, he reiterates the fact he calls them the beasts of Ephesus. So obviously, many harsh things have come. When we get to later on verses, I'll. I'll expand on that a bit more. So this is the background we're coming from. And Paul, like I said, as it was transported into our time, he says to us, know this, that we're going to be living in stressful times. And my version says um, perilous times, but, you know, difficult times. That's what it means. For he moves on to verse 2. He says, for men will be lovers of themselves. Now, isn't that true today? You have a look at the advertising on TV, right? All the commercials. It's all about me, isn't it? It's all about me feeling good. You know, if it's right, it's all about me. That's what the advertising is about today. And Paul emphasizes that. He says, men will be lovers of themselves. And he goes on to verses after verse here, stipulating on what they will be like. He says they will be lovers of money. Now, isn't that true? Look at what people are prepared to do for money today. I mean, some poor person gets mugged or killed for $10 in a, in a park. And, you know, what does that achieve? Yet this is how they are. And we know that the, um, uh, the uh, James, in his letter, he writes, he says, for the, the, for the love of the money is the root of all evil. See, we're all surrounded with money. We can't overcome that. You know, we need money to tra trans, um, go through our daily routines. But to be lovers of money is something different because all of a sudden we start to worship the money. And it's all about the money. It's all about the money. And once a person comes to that stage, a person, a, a, a friend, a neighbour or a brother or a sister has got no relevance. And uh, we, of course, in our family have seen many things like that because um, family disputes are one of the uh, most tragic disputes that can happen amongst us because we're not all Christians. We don't all come from the same you know, direction. And what people are prepared to do for money is you know, sometimes uh, beyond comprehension. You know, we had a, we had a battle that we could have taken to court, but we decided not to. And uh, when I prayed about it, which my four of us, my brother, his wife, and my wife had to agree with, um, I prayed about it. And you know what the Lord said to me? He says, you've got to lose to win. You've got to lose to win. You think about that for a month. You've got to lose to win. Was, wasn't Jesus counted as a loser? You know, I mean, you know, to be arrested, he didn't fight, he didn't do anything against the then hierarchy. He didn't even, he even told Pilate, you know, my kingdom's not of this kingdom. Pilate was amazed. He says, well, aren't you going to say something? Look at all the accusations. Jesus stood silent. What did he say? He said, my kingdom is not of this kingdom. He says, if my kingdom was here, I'd stand up and fight. My followers would stand up and fight. But he says, no. My kingdom is not of this kingdom. Look, lovers of money, boasters, <laughs> we come across that every day, don't we? People love to tell tall stories. You know, the fish was this big. You know, it was, it was this big. It was actually that small and got lost, but it was this big, you know. 
So if they can only have someone to believe them, but Paul tells us clearly, he says they will be proud. They will be proud. You know, how many people, you know, pride is the pride is the downfall of many. Pride is the downfall of Lucifer because he was proud. He thought that he being the principal there next to God in heaven could do anything and God showed him no you can't no you can't God will always be God but you see as they serve him as they serve the enemy in in this life you see all the enemy's fruits wear off on them they walk in the same fruits you know we work in we walk in the uh, fruits that's written there in Galatians love joy peace temperance they w- walk in these fruits so it's no wonder that we're surrounded by them he says they are blasphemers you know they're abusive and another version will say they're abusive they have no problem at all to you know tear a part of you apart especially if they don't agree with you which is often many times especially if it comes to scripture or something of god they will definitely not agree with us but they're not afraid to blaspheme. They're not afraid to express something which is their own opinion, whether true or not, but to oppose. He says, here's a very good one. Look at this one. Disobedient to parents. How sad. We raised our children to the glory of God. Our children listened to us. Our children went through the learning curve but they realise that it's good to listen to mum and dad because at the end of the day, there's wisdom in the words, you know, even if they had their own little ideas, there's wisdom. But look at the generation we live in today. This is, see, this is the problem. This is the enemy at work. When the family structure's broken down, which is in progress right now, because you don't belong to anyone, you're your own person, you do as you please. If it feels good, you're not hurting anyone, it's okay, just do it. And that's the mentality that's out there, you know. Um, your mother and father now can't spank you because if they do, you can divorce them, you can leave them. The authorities have got, you know, like in Canada, power to come in and take the children away because you're not allowed to chastise your children. And you see, how further is this from the truth? I mean, Solomon, in his wisdom, he says, spare the rod, and he says, you'll ruin the child. Isn't that true? I mean, we ourselves are corrected of God. How many times he's had to redirect with a little chastising our lives for us to keep on a narrow. And the children are just meant to be left on their own to do their own thing. Look, how many times have you seen on TV when these kids get caught out, you know, at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, something drastic has happened or a car accident, even the police sergeant on the interview or whoever it is, the policeman saying, where are these people's parents? Have you ever heard them say that? Where are these people's parents? I mean, the parents, you know, it's sort of this out of sight, out of mind thing, you know, so long as you don't annoy us, you know, just go and do your thing. We don't care, but don't bother us. And the children have learned this. So they're disobedient. They're not just disobedient to parents, but they're disobedient to all forms of authority. See, today, the police, courts, it's all a joke. How many times have you seen them coming out of court, smoking, laughing, you know, it's all a joke, you know, in court. You know, the court give them a slap on the hand and uh, tell them to be good from then on. It's all a joke. And that's the contempt that they hold power and authority in. And the sad part for us is that we're hoping that something good is going to come out of this. And we see that it's not because the world's going 100 miles an hour that way and we're going the opposite way. And the only way the two can come together, as my brother said at the uh, Holy Communion, is Christ through his blood. That's the only connection. Unless they come to Christ, there's no hope. No hope for them. And that's our purpose. We're out there with that little beacon in the light. That, and if anybody's searching, yes, we'll tell you what the truth is. It goes on and on. Unthankful, unholy. 
you know, today, if you do the right, well, there's two ways you can take that. Today, if you do the right thing, you know, the guy will say, what's wrong with you? You know, you don't do the right thing today. You know, if the guy's lost his wallet and you found it and gave it back to him, some other guy will say, you idiot, you should have kept it. You know, what's wrong with you? This is the way they perceive life. Unthankful, unholy. And the person, you know, who you've done good to, he thinks that, you know, it's your obligation to do that and you'll never see you before. You know, whereas with us as a Christian, if you do the right thing to me, I'm thankful to you. I'll give you thanks. I say thank you very much. You see, what a com- it's a completely different world, completely different world, unholy. You know, how many songs have we sang today? Be holy, for I am holy. We can't approach God without unless we're holy. You know, Moses, look at Moses' battle with the Lord. You see, Moses said, Lord, I want to see you. And he said to him, Moses, the day you see me, you will die because he's holy. We can't perceive how holy it is. You know, the only way John could write revelations, he says he was taken up in the spirit. He couldn't go up like this because nothing like this, our our flesh and blood is corruptible and nothing corruptible can go up there. So we've got to be holy. But you see, this world is completely unholy. He says, unloving. Next verse, verse three. So it just goes on and on. There's no love in this world. You know, they continually talk and sing about love, love. But you know, the the love of this world is different to the love of Christ because the love of Christ is that if you do wrong to me, I'll forgive you and I still love you. That's the love of Christ. The love of this world is that as Jesus said to uh, about the tax collectors and the Pharisees, that you only love those who do good to you. You know, if you do good to me, then I'm thankful and okay. But if you do the wrong thing for me, there's no way I can love you. And you see, this is how the world progresses. Unforgiving. They're unforgiving. They won't forgive you. And Sadly, we've got that even the Christian co- uh, congregations today because um, we have within our own family group, you know, because of all the things that transpire in the family arguments over the years and decades, you know, they say, we can forgive, but we can't forget. So how do you reconcile the two? You see, there's really no f- forgiveness there. Jesus says, forgive and you will be forgiven. So how do we want to be forgiven if we can't forgive? Yet some people think that God's going to do some miraculous act, you know, and bypass all this and just allow their little routine to, you know, flow through and they'll get into heaven somehow. And only God knows, only God knows. But, you know, we have to be careful because the kingdom is, of heaven is his And he made a promise to the father, remember? Remember what he said? He said, Father, nothing unclean will enter your kingdom. Nothing. So how do we have to be? Can you see how we have to stick out in this world like a sore thumb? Look how many people are going past us over here. They have no intentions whatsoever of coming to church. They have no interest, only maybe if someone's grievously sick or something's happened in the family or passed to pray for us. We've got a whole heap of people will pray for, you know, Pastor Glenn knows our prayer board is full of people, but they won't come to church. They'll accept our prayers, but they don't come to church. What about if you come along with us, pray with us? What do we do? You see the world we live in? <laughs> oh, this scripture fascinates me because, you know, I've read this for 50 years and I've seen the transformation that we are going through because when we came to Melbourne 1963, things were completely different. If the policeman stopped you, then you were frozen. If he asked you a question, you'd answer him. What are you doing on the street? You had to give him an answer. Today, they'd ignore him. We used to be able to put the milk money out at the side of the fence, some of you would remember, and we'd get the milk over there. You couldn't do that in the late 60s, early 70s, because people woke up and, you know, realised that you come, you know, just walk through the streets and load your money, your pockets up with money. This is just then. And then 
as we progress, you see the transformation of where we are now. Well, you know, the world's heading towards Sodom and Gomorrah and saying, don't stop us. That's where we want to get to. And that's why these scriptures fascinate me because I've seen it visually. It, it, the whole landscape has changed in front of me. Next word, he says, slanderers. How important that is. You see, whether it's right or not, it's very easy to slander someone. You know, we could accuse Mas, uh, Pastor Glenn of any crime that we want and he, he would feel slurred or if it would happen to me, don't, don't think I'm picking on you, brother. Uh, if it would happen to me, um, we'd have to prove ourselves out of the situation. You know, they say, oh, this guy's a pedophile and go, hang on. Where did you come up with this idea? And we have to try and prove ourselves out of that situation. Yet, for a person, it's no problem at all to slur you, to attack you for something that's not true. Unbelievable. It says, without self-control. You can see that every day on the street there. I mean, 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, can you remember pulling up to the street uh, uh, red light and someone coming up to you and dragging you out of your car and driving off with your car? That's just in the last five years, they realise they can hijack a car in the middle of the road. So you know self-control. They take drugs, they smoke pot, and they get to court and uh, it's always he was alcohol affected, he was drug affected. It's, it's not the person, it's the drug and it's the alcohol. You see, the person always steps back, the person is blameless. You know, the alcohol made me do it. It's the old saying, like, the devil made me do it, you know? But the devil can't make you do anything. We know scripture, what does it say? It says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But these people, they want to shake his hand. And of course, he's got a right to be there. You know, if I invite him, he's got a right to be there. I reject him and he's got to go away. Oh, what a world we live in. Uh, not without self-control, brutal. Brutal and despises of all who are good. We can see that again today. Um, for the, the violence that happens out there is unheard of. You know, would you or you, you and your children, would you feel safe in the Melbourne city at 10 o'clock at night? I mean, gangs go in with machetes and things there. They're just looking for a fight to do something. This is the world we live in today. Yet, you know, we're told by parliamentarians that it's never been safer than now. You know, it's, it's really good. Well, Daniel Andrews always tells us it's really good, you know. You know, we, 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 we don't know. Everything's going terrific. But it's not. It's not because the more we kick God out of everything, the more evil comes in and the more evil dominates society. And that's why we have a situation like we have right now. And there's no turning back. You know, we need a complete overhaul of everything. And only God can do that. Believe me, we can't do it. All we do is pray constantly. We pray. You know, you know what we like? I'll, I'll simulate it to, to Sodom and Gomorrah. You know when some, Sodom and Gomorrah was in the pits? Do you know where Lot was? He was at the city gate praying and mourning. That's where Lot was. Because he thought he picked the better part from Abraham when they chose, but he got the worst part when he realised where he was. He mourned at the city gate until the angels came to rescue him. That's where we are today. Some of us, we mourn at the city gate. We hope things to get better, but it's all in God's hands. Traders, <laughs> there's a good one. You know, for, for a family member or a relative or even a friend to give you up, means nothing you know if they're not in christ i'm saying to give you up is nothing you know uh you're only fodder you know you're nothing this is where we are they're not ashamed to um stand against you to lie against you to do anything to prevail against you because they're traitors, they don't care. And mind you, this goes back to Jesus' time because we, you know, when they asked him um, about the last times, Jesus said them the same, said to uh, the disciples the same thing. He says, 
parents will betray children, children will betray parents, one will be against another, three against two, two against three. So is, is it amazing that we're in the situation we are in? You know, thank God for the cross. Thank God for the cross. The cross unites us. Under the cross, with a Christian family, we're all family, we all belong to one another. In a Christian situation, we know where we are. All these people out there see them, they don't know where they are. They've got a veil over their eyes and they can't see. They think that life continues like that and hopefully everything works out in the end and that's it, it comes to a finish. But we know that's not so. There is a finish, Jesus says, I'm coming. And I'm bringing my reward. And everyone says, Amen to that, right? But there's good rewards and bad rewards. There's two rewards. There's bad rewards, you know. Where are we? Without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong. You know what headstrong is? Mine's KJV, determined. You know, you've got people who are determined to... They, they get some weird idea, crazy idea, and they're determined to take that through to the end, you know. Um, this guy did bad to me, I'm going to burn his car down. They're determined. Oh, I know guys like this, believe me. I come from a rough, younger days. You had to be there, you know, because we were the wogs then. You know, we got our share of beatings. But I come from a background like this. You know, people didn't have a problem at all, you know. If they're going to get you, they're going to get you, whatever happens. And that's how they are. You see, Paul saw this. That's why he wrote it in this, like it's headstrong, it's, it's, it's determined. The next one's haughty. Another word for it would be arrogant. Arrogance rules today, doesn't it? I mean, hello, don't come near me. You know, don't talk to me like that. You know, I haven't got time for you. You know, arrogance rules. What a world. What a world. Thank God he saved us from all this. Amen. Amen. It says, lovers, of, <laughs> this is a classic today, Sunday, lovers of pleasure rather than the lovers of God. What's important today? There's a race on in the city. We can go for a bike ride. You can go and play cricket. You know, there's, we can go swimming. We can go picnicking somewhere. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You know, God hasn't got a place in life you know you know what the lord said to me years ago he said the lord said to me he says without me he says your life would be empty amen my life would be empty without him that's why i boast in the fact that i boast that he's let me drown myself immerse in these words i love his words because his words are life his words are life Another important thing for today, verse 5, first part, having a form of godliness but de denying the power of it, right? Christmas, Easter, everyone's holy or, you know, whoever wants to be. You know, we're a church, you know, we, we, we do the procession, we do whatever, Christmas time, Easter time, any other time, don't bother us. You know, we've got busy things. We've got cricket, we've got swimming, we've got take the kids there, we've got bicycle rides, we've got all sorts of things. But you see, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power because they think uh, parliamentarians are classic. I'm not, don't, get me wrong i'm not accusing everyone of that because there are good parliamentarians we deal with some of them we deal with people who have still have christian morals but parliamentarians are classic with that you see christmas time you'll see them at the church over there you know standing shaking hands with the cardinal whoever you know we've done our bit you know we're christian as well having a form of godliness but is there a god well we don't know you know is there a God? They're not sure. But this is the world we live in. That's why it's amazing when we look at these words and try and relate ourselves to that, to, to where they are and where we are, and we, all we can say, thank God that he saved us from that. Thank God that he's opened our eyes. Thank God that we can see clearly now because if, if we didn't see clearly, we'd be out there. We wouldn't be here. We'd be there with them. Shopping, doing whatever else is important. And, well, I've got to move into a bit of 
more history here. See, he says in verse 6, For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captive of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. I've got to go back to the story, the, the, the history of Ephesus. If you remember in the beginning how I said, you know, Paul refers to them as the beast, beasts of Ephesus. Now, if you remember, because we've got to connect the two with Acts of Apostles. If you remember, the Lord said to him, stay there because I have many chosen. He was there. He was there for nearly two years. We're not sure how long, but at least 18 months. And he was there. He preached the words, but he had huge battles. And what was the conclusion, if you go back to Acts, of his departure from Ephesus? The Jews heard that he's doing you know, great things there, came in, talked to who? The, the principal women, you know, the women who have high uh, positions, high, wives of high positions, and some of the people who led the city. They talked to them and persuaded them, you've got to get rid of this guy. You've got to get rid of this guy. So that's where this thing comes from. And remember the other thing in Eph Ephesus. Do you remember who the major goddess was? You remember who the major, you know, he had a big battle there because they had a goddess, Diana. Remember they were screaming, Diana the Great, Diana. And the town clerk had to disperse them. You see, scripture runs together. They reckon the Bible doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to those who don't study it. It makes complete sense because Acts of Apostles connects with these scriptures. And they're all screaming, Diana the Great, Diana the Great. And the town clerk had to disperse them because he thought that the Romans would come and, you know, you know, they'll just, the, the, the legion would just charge through them. So the town clerk said, look, everyone go home because, you know, um, we're going to cause a riot today. But you see, this is how um, Paul highlights that the women, the principal women that were, uh, that's how he comes to these words because he's writing to the church there in Ephesus and he knows who they are. He says, gullible woman, gullible women. You know, Mind you, don't get offended. It doesn't have to be women. There's a lot of gullible men too. Because today, if people come into your household with all sorts of tracts and informations and uh, say to you that it's like this and like that, unless you know this book, what are you going to embrace and what are you going to reject? Our friend, you know, Pastor Bill, he was at the show and uh, they have a stall over there. The brethren actually put it on. They've got a stall at the show every year and uh, they give out tracts and witness to people and opposite them there's a Christian tarot tarot reading thing oh now have you heard of anything like that and a Baptist pastor apparently is really leading that now how does one relate to the other you know I'm going to make a series of cards up for you and I'll I'll tell you your Christian f future doesn't make any sense. You see, this is what he's referring to, gullible people, people who can be persuaded this way or the other way. You know, um, there's, there's a lot of people who get persuaded into all these different religions and sects, like I said, again, only because they don't know the truth. They don't know the Bible. Jesus simply said, remember, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. So if you read this book and you come across this thing, you go, hang on, this is a non, you know. If they were in the Old Testament, you know what would happen? They drag these people out the side and stone them. All you need is two or three witnesses. That's the Old Testament. This is a freedom that we li live in today. You know, you can do anything you want out there. But things are has different but still haven't changed because judgment comes at the end. You know, what a man has sown, that's what he's going to reap. Don't forget, we've got to walk in what we preach and what we believe in. <laughs> he, there's a lot of people in verse 7, he says, always learning and never be able to come to the, to, to the knowledge of the truth. You know, I can read, I've got umpteenth books and books I read, but you know, um, I've got files of them and Pax, Mark always tells me to get rid of my stuff because it's all clogged up in the bedroom over there. But I'm only, I read a book with the perspective that I, I want to know the opinion that this person is coming from, but 
I still am with the freedom of mind to choose to pick what is biblical and if anything is not biblical to reject it. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what sort of book you're reading, it's the perspective of that author. I can write you a book about whatever, but it's my opinion. You know, if it doesn't go with this book, um, it's to be rejected, as simple as that. And Paul says to him, because see, Paul was confounded with this because by the time he wrote the second letter, even in the first letter I'm doing with our church, I'm doing the pastoral letters, but even by the time he, he wrote the first letter of Timothy and Titus, they're the two letters that go together, he was confounded with Gnosticism. You know, in Acts 20, let's go back to Acts 20, he gets, he didn't go back to, interestingly, he didn't go back to Ephesus. If you read Acts 20, he went to the next town and he called the elders of Ephesus. He must have had something drastic must have happened there, over there. But anyway, he calls them over there and he says to them this. He says, after my departure, he says, I know many grievous wolves will enter the flock, not sparing. He told them that plainly. And it's only a matter of, uh, from the time that he wrote that, it's only a matter of five to seven years. And he's already address addressing Gnosticism because they've already infiltrated the church. Can you see how quickly it happened? That's why, pray for your brother and yeah, for our pastor Glenn and sister Carol. They're the gateway of who they let in here and who they don't, you know. You can get someone in here who's going to start telling you that, you know, you've been doing this all wrong up till now. You know, we'll tell you how you should do it after that. No, that's the furthest from the truth. Jesus says, I'm the same yesterday, today and forever. He doesn't change. His word doesn't change. You know, if I want to introduce something new into the church, that's only my idea. You know, we'll, we'll make some cards up or I will read everyone's future here. How silly. And people accept it. It's even sadder. You see, what a, it's Paul, Paul, he knows, he says, ever learning but never coming to the truth. Come to the truth. I better finish up. Sorry, guys. Um, I'll finish with verse 8. It goes on and on. He says, now, as Jannes and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds dis disapproved concerning the faith. He describes them perfectly. You know the story of Jannes and Jambres, don't you? Back from Exodus. Consider how foolish these people were. You know what they said to Moses? Moses, let's go back to Egypt. It was better for us in Egypt than it is here. That's what they said to him. That's what they wanted. Now, that's the furthest from the truth. You, you remember what Pharaoh made them do? Pharaoh made them because they were successful. Pharaoh made them do the bricks by day and he made them collect the straw by night. So was it better in Egypt? But these guys are persuaded. Oh, come on, let's go out in the world. It's better there than, you know, to be in a church. What would you want to do in a gloomy church today on a Sunday? You could be riding your bike now, going fishing. This is the way they perceive it. And you see, the end result, I'll finish, guys, sorry. The end result, what happens? God deals with them. God deals with them. What did he say to Moses? He says, Moses, he says, you come over here. Who believes you stand here? Whoever wants to follow them, just stand there. Remember what happened? <sighs> One massive burial. See, God deals with them. But in the meantime, that's the sad part. We've got to put up with it. That's our patience. Jesus says in Revelations, here is the patience of the saints. We've got to put up with all this, you know. We've got to rebuke it. We've got to have answers for it. And we've got to put up with it. But we know that God, at the end of the day, will deal with it. But our job is not to follow any of these things that Paul saw and wrote to them. We've got to take the fruits of the Spirit on. And we've got to realise that, you know, Scripture tells us everything. Scripture tells us the good part. Scripture tells us the bad part. And as, as the Lord says, he says, reject the good and you will live. Take the bad and you will die. It's as simple as that. There's only two roads. There's no purgatory. You don't preach purgatory, do you? <laughs> There's purgatory. 
Uh, sorry, guys. I'm always humoured by that. You know, we we in the pastor circles we joke about this because we said we've read the Bible. We haven't found that word in there. You know, it must be hidden somewhere. But anyway, there's only two ways, and praise God that while we continue on the right road, Jesus is here to help us. That's the thing. Our race is not alone. We're not doing this on our own. Ivan can't do this by his own power. Trust me, I go through the valleys and hills too. You know, there are high times, there are low times. I'm totally dependent on him. And he go, gets us through. Why? Because we trust in him. We don't want any part of that. You know, Jesus says, you know, in the Gospel of John, he says, we are in the world, but not of the world. How important that is. We're in this world. We can't help it. We've got to do the same things we do tomorrow. You know, we go out and we're working and we're doing, we're mingling amongst people, but we are not off the world because we don't act like this, like what I read up. We have to be completely different. And this is how you bring people to salvation when they say, What's different about you? Why do you do this? You see, it opens a door of opportunity. Well, I'm a Christian and this is the, what, the way the Lord has told us. And that's all our obligation is, believe me. You know, we sometimes think that, you know, when we started out, we thought we'd convert the world, but it didn't quite work out like that, did it? Because, you know, we got a lot of rejection, we got a lot of flack, but it doesn't matter. The only important part is that we are here and we are to witness for him. And if we've done that, we've fulfilled our commission. The rest is God's work. You know, we read, brother, you read from Acts chapter 2 when uh, uh, Peter preached to the congregation. Remember the 3,000? Peter didn't convert the 3,000. It says the Holy Spirit moved through and convicted their hearts. They were convicted in, they were cut in their hearts, it said. And all they could say is, men and brethren, what shall we do? And the answer was simple. That's our answer to people. Amen. Thanks for having us.